If you're an online fitness coach and you're looking to build your business, this is going to be something you're definitely going to watch, listen to, share it, and listen back through multiple times. Today we've got uh, a great friend of mine, Frank Den Blanken, who's helped me a lot through my journey from where I started as being uh, an estate agent to now uh, running one of the biggest fitness businesses in the world, whilst having a fitness mastermind and fixed scaling system time behind me. So thank you very much for your time today, Frank. Anytime. To give a brief synopsis in terms of your background of who you are, Frank, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, 60 second intro, who are you? Uh, Frank Blanken from the Netherlands. I run an online fitness uh, fitness coaching business there. Probably, it might be the biggest one in the world. I don't know that for sure, but it, it will probably be close to it. Been doing that for past nine years. I have a team in total, probably over 100 people in total that work there now. And yeah, I've been helping other entrepreneurs in different groups help scale them and basically teach them what I know. So I think my number one skill is probably like acquiring leads. That's probably where I'm really good at. So sharing that knowledge and how to do that stuff. Okay. So the biggest challenge that a lot of people come to us with is they need more leads, they need more leads. A lot of the time I actually say to people that leads necessarily aren't the problem is the fact they don't know how to price their programs correctly. They don't actually know how to sell and their closing is terrible yeah. and their program is actually shit. Um, but let, let's start with lead generation because that's where most people think they have the biggest issue. What do you say, what do you see at the moment is the biggest home run that most people aren't hitting when it comes to lead generation? First of all, it's a program that works. So if you get results, it's pr pretty easy to get results. Like think about it like you, for yourself. You do it by own transformation. And what happens, you go to a birthday party and four or five people ask you like, hey, can you help me with my diet? That's literally getting leads. It's just so as, as long as you can do your own transformation or you can help five people for free even, just get results. That's how you start. And then you want to find an, basically a certain process that works and you just keep doing that. And then say, yeah, this is the process that I always use and it always delivers results. And I wanted to shoot that. And more people will respond to that. And that's literally how you keep growing. That comes inside of one of the things I think is a big mistake is that for people to scale their business, they need to scale who they are in terms of like, if you're a fitness coach, you should probably be in good shape and lead by example. It's yeah. going to make life a lot easier. Like, it is. And because it's like you're trying to sell something that you can't actually do. And it's like you see business coaches who don't have a fitness business trying to sell something they haven't done and it's not really congruent. Why do you think a lot of coaches don't take their own training maybe as seriously as they should? I think a lot of them or either get stuck in two things or they just love the knowledge expect. And they want to learn more, and they want to learn more, and they want to learn more. But if you really look at it, like, there are some, take Joe Bennett, for example, hypertrophy coach on Instagram. You can find him. Smartest guy that I know probably, like, and how to build muscle. I have a couple trainings with him. He's super smart. Are there a thousand trainers that make more money than him? Absolutely. Like, he doesn't care about making a lot of money and stuff like that. He, like, if he makes 15, 20K a month, he's happy. He doesn't need to do anything else. And he can live the lifestyle he wants, which is fine. Like, I respect him for being able to choose for that route. But if you're like, I want to grow and I want to go to certain levels, knowledge is not going to get you there. Then it's more like, okay, you're going to find trainers within your business that are smart as Joe to run your business, but you're got to be the marketing brain and actually scale the business. So there's a big difference in that. It's funny you say that because I actually had a conversation with someone earlier. It's like, you can do all the N1 training courses you want, all the precision new training courses you want, but if you're shit at marketing, sales, and lead generation, you never actually get to show how good you are at coaching because yeah. you have no fucking clients in the first place. Yeah. Um, so the reality is you have to start with that part of the process without, otherwise you have no one to coach. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why you and me have always got on very well as we're very congruent in terms of like passion about business and training, even though you take the piss out of my calves all the time, which have improved, I'd like to add. Um, yeah. mainly because of some fr Frank's constant pressure that my calves are terrible. With that being said, if we took everything away from you tomorrow, um, your email list, which is vast, your social media following, which is half of the Netherlands, um, what would be the first thing you would do tomorrow if you were starting a fitness business again? Uh, first thing I would do is like start collaborations. Like, There's no quicker way to grow than to find people that basically have your audience but don't market to them yet because they're not interested in it. So, for example, I know a lot of people that make recipe guides, but they don't offer fitness coaching. I can work with somebody who makes recipe guides and offer the training aspect, and I can get clients from that person straight away. So I would just reach out to that person on Instagram 
ask them, and I will start low, like somebody with a thousand to five thousand followers in that range, because the reach is the reach. Like if you DM them, they won't have fifty DMs waiting on them. Like it's not that our account is that busy. You're gonna reach out to somebody who has half a million. Likely you're not gonna get through it. But I would start somewhere like that, and I will literally do every week. I would do collaborations, and uh, so that I get my name out. Next to that, I would post a lot of content, but like high level content. I know I can teach. So if I'm start teaching stuff, I will do that. And then I would look like, I would personally, I like to go quick. So I will use ad spend. So I will use paid traffic because what I would do is like, I will want to test faster. So let's say your program is going to be 3K for six months. I'm willing to spend 3K per month because I know with my content, if I'm going to put that out, I'm going to get at least one client. So that's a hundred bucks a day Then I'm going to put in ads. But if I just do a, a good video and I put a hundred pounds in ads uh, spent behind it, they're gonna people are gonna like the com- post, comment the post, stuff like that. I'm gonna reach out to those people. You cannot tell me that if I spend a hundred bucks a day on thirty posts in a month. So every day I'm just adding them to that campaign budget. That I probably will sign up twenty clients the first month by just doing that. Then so I'll make sixty k in cash collect uh, that's coming. So I may have made like something a little because I don't always sell paid in full. But let's say. You at least made 15K. The next month, I will double my ad spend, double the volume. I will get 40 clients, and I'll just keep going like that. Probably at the point where I'm getting around 50, 60 clients, I'm going to hire my first coach who's going to take the service over me. I'm going to film myself, loom video myself, like the first month, how I do the coaching, how I do check-ins, how I do everything, and I'll get a team built. With the content, here's one really easy secret for anyone listening and watching to this. Um, people often ask, oh, what's working, what's going viral? easiest strategy to do this actually if you get the app TikTok if you go in the search function type in on fat loss tips for men top right you've got filters if you put last 30 days the most liked it'll come up with what's trending and that's the type of content you should be making so a lot of people really struggle with that so for anyone listening that's a really easy strategy you can implement Um, and one of the things we teach within the 4C method um, which we have a free course on which you can download underneath this podcast if you hit the link it gives you free access to that we're not going to sell anything Um, free access to everything there do you think, Frank, with content, people have gotten too lazy in a lot of respects? Like people, I see people who have less time than me, or sorry, have much more time than me, like I haven't got time to make content. Uh, not, not per se lazy. I think a knowledge aspect is very important. Like you can give me 50 titles and I'll shoot, a sing- in one take I'll shoot the video and it will be a good video. Because I know my content inside out that I have to teach. Because it's not like that I'm teaching chasm level of content like from M1. Like, most people just want to learn, like, five tips how to lose fat. Like, it's basic level knowledge. So I can shoot that video pretty easily. And then three protein sources to eat. Like, those things for me are very easy to shoot. So I just think that people overcomplicate it a lot. They think they have to make something new, something special. Like, I've been doing this now for nine years. Probably some videos, I made 50 different variations of it. Like, it's literally five tips. It was like one, two, three, four, five, and then it's five, four, three, three, one. And then it's one, two, four, five, and then three. I literally rotated literally the, t- the points, and I made the video again and again and again. Why? It works, and it gets clients. So I keep making the same video. So it's just, then I have to bl- I have a blue shirt, and I have a red shirt, and I have a yellow shirt. Like, it's like split testing, but it all stays the same. It comes to split testing. Um, do you do that with your content? Yeah, a lot. So I think a great example for somebody to actually see this in action, you go to YouTube, you check out the profile of Paul Revelia. He's a coach in the US, who's content prep. He has so many videos going from 22% body fat to 8%. Then he has 21 to 10, 19 to 6. Like he has probably like 40 of those videos, which are exactly the same thing. He explains the same thing. It's just the title is a little bit different and it's a different background. But they're all the same content. But that content gets him clients. And he's been doing that for the past five years. He started solo. He now has a team of 74 coaches. They have thousands of coaching clients. Simple formula, just rinse and repeat, and it just works. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes people make, and that's what I say to people a lot. It's like, it's not what I tell you to do, it's often what I tell you not to do that's more important, because I think people get big red shiny object syndrome and I get that a lot. I mean, I get that a lot with you where you share something with me like, for fuck's sake, I've got to do this now. I'm like, just slow down. And it's like, I think yeah. one of the things that's important is like singularity of focus on trying to like identify what's the big need of moving the business and you just focus on that until that's fixed. Because as we said earlier, there's obviously content lead gen 
uh, sales and the fulfillment side of things. If something else is broken, you shouldn't probably spend all your time on lead gen when you can't sell yeah. anyone. Um, looking back at when I started, I think you probably first met me in 2020, 2021. Yeah. What do you think was the biggest mistake I was making back then? Because it's probably relevant to people in the audience. Uh, you first of all, your low ticket program. Yeah. You're shredding an aid that was killing your business. That's probably number one. And... I was like, it's probably like the singularity of focus aspect, that was probably the major one. Like you were doing so much stuff, I was like, that doesn't even produce money. So why are you even doing that? And just, I, and this is probably the thing that I told Charlie the most is like, you probably hate money because you still haven't taken action on it. Because I literally told him like, just do this and it will work. And it took him six months to complete it. I'm like, you can do that in four hours. <laughs> like, just do it and j you'll see what happens. So some of this is probably a mental block. That it was like you had made, need to make a mental shift of somebody is like, oh, I'm starting my fitness business. Okay, now I'm going to scale my fitness business and I'm gonna actually going to do this. Because there is a point, usually it's around 10K per month, that people are still have like mental blocks. And if you want to go to 30K, and from 30K you want to go to 100K, like those are, you have to become a different person. So your identity as a person has to switch. And as soon as you make that switch, you will never go back. And you just keep growing. But you need to make that switch. And most of the time, you will need somebody to tell you what to do and basically make you, basically almost force you to make that switch and then you will get there. Do you remember the conversation we had? I think I was doing like 50K a month at the time and I said, I want to do 60K. Yeah. And you were like, that's fucking shit. Yeah. Like, it, I see numbers and I'm very logical in my brain. So I look at it and I see volumes and I see this, the whole picture and I'm like, why are you aiming for that? Like, if you just do this, you easily hit that number. So I see, I speak to a lot of entrepreneurs and they, they show me their, like, their KPIs dashboard and how the numbers are looking. That's basically, like, how many calls you're booking, how, what's your show up rate, how many calls you're closing. So it's, like, an overview of your business. And if you look at it and you see what's broken, you fix one of those issues, the business will explode. And it's not like, oh, you go up at 10K. You know, you literally go up at 40 or 50K if you do that correctly. So I looked at your business at that time and I was looking, Charlie, you just fix this and you're probably going to triple your business. It's all you need to do. And it's a single thing that you need to fix. And you were like, I will just want to get from 50 to 60K. And I'm like, you fix that, you probably hit 150K. Like, why are you aiming for 60 when you can go for 100, 150K pretty easily by just fixing one thing? The, uh, and then this is why I say to people at times, you don't know what you don't know at the time. And the short end of that story is that I think I said, uh, I think we settled on like somewhere around 70K. We negotiated. And I think I ended up doing like 80K. <laughs> yeah. And at that time I was like, fuck me. Like my head fell off. And then that's like, now that'd be fucking atrocious. And that's a relativity for a lot of people is that you get accustomed to certain levels. And when you get to a new height, you almost have your own self doubts of what's possible. And I think yeah. ultimately it's like, I don't know, if you're doing 10K a month at the moment, 100K is just put another zero on the end essentially. So it's like, add another zero on how many calls you're booking, how many yeah. outbound messages you're doing. And when you start to think like that, it's not actually that complicated to scale. Yeah. It's just realizing that probably everything will break when you 10X yeah. stuff. I like the thing that Alex Mosey said on a podcast. It's like either spend 100 bucks a day on ads or do 100 outbound messages a day. That's enough to make a million bucks in a year. And it's so true. And it's not more complicated than that. So either you want to spend money or you're just going to work really hard and send out a lot of messages. And... I was like, it's true, it's just volume at some point. So you got to do more, which sounds like crazy, but it's the same thing with training. Like you could get away when you start out with lifting, like with a 185 pound bench press. But 10 years in, you're probably going to need to do more sets, more reps and more weight. It's the same thing with business. And I think something I see a lot is, I, I actually remember this is a good story. So at the beginning stage, I remember you used to fucking text me at like, 4.30 and being you awake yet and you like we'd be messaging each other at like stupid o'clock and I remember that was probably the most I ever worked I used to work from like 5 a.m. to probably 8 9 p.m. at night and I speak with people now who are like how do you do this when you're starting with all the other stuff going on so you've got to do fucking more work like yeah. with every business there's a hustle phase at the beginning yeah and I think people are too afraid to understand that you have to do that and that uh, I think in order to be a successful entrepreneur there's like this period probably around five years that you really need to push it, like, hard. It's not, like, not a healthy way that you're working. But I think it's necessary to get to a level. And after that, you can bring team members in to get your time back. But that level is necessary to grow. 
I, I remember reading the book of Kobe Bryant, Mama Mentality. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's probably the best book you can read about that mindset. And literally his, I remember he, there's a part of it in it where he's in Italy. And he's still, I think, in high school or something he is. And he's literally making a calculation. Oh, in the U.S., they're practicing basketball so many hours. So if I just do this volume number and I keep doing that till I'm 18, I'm going to be so much better. I'll get to the NBA and be a superstar there, even though I'm not the most talented person in the world. And it's actually so true. If you just focus on certain things and you just keep doing it, like it's insane what kind of progress you can actually make. When you first meet people, do you see in some people they have that mam- Mamba mentality like Kobe Bryant? Uh, not straight away, but you can figure out real quick. Like I think the, the quickest way t- for me to find out is if I actually do a workout with somebody and you can see, oh, oh they can actually push themselves or they just give up. Like there's a level that goes in there. So you can see that. But also it's like, are people coachable? Like you give them something that actually works and do they actually do it or do they just keep waiting and can't wait and come up with excuses? Because a lot of times the things you're doing keeps you at a certain level and you need to make a tiny switch to go to the next level. Why do you think people are afraid to make that switch? It feel, it's like stepping out of your comfort zone. You just have a certain comfort zone and you want to step out in order to grow. And there's a, bigger step out and then you actually get super stressed which I think you still should hit out sometimes but like there's a lot of people just they do, they feel safe within it and just stepping out of that feels super weird and they don't do it this is a completely unpopular opinion but one of my opinions is that you should be feeling really fucking stressed at least probably three days a week yeah. and if you're not in that point where you're really pr- pushing it and you feel like you're on the upper threshold of what you can take you're probably not trying hard enough yeah. and I think too many people expect huge results without huge work ethic and maybe huge sacrifice. Yeah. They expect to put like average uh, work ethic and time into something, yeah. but exponential results. The reality is someone else will come in and just outwork them and, and rinse them all day long. And I think that a lot of people think it get goes quickly. Like for example, it took nine months, even though I got a lot of sales calls before I closed my first sales call. It took nine months. So a lot of people come in and like... That story. Yeah. And a lot of people come in and like within three months they expect to make 10K a month. I'm like, most likely not. Like most people that I know, it takes three years to get extra traction on a social media platform. That's how long you need to post consistently. Two to three years and then you will literally shoot it up. I remember being in Vancouver talking to Dan Locke, which is an amazing YouTube channel. It took him four years of, I think, posting three times a week before his YouTube channel took off and actually started growing. He was between zero and, f- and then thousands of followers and then it started growing. He, I looked at my channels after that day. I was in my hotel room. I looked at my things. I'm like... I got the same thing. And I asked two friends of mine, they were like, same thing. It literally takes a long time for it actually to get traction. So a lot of people are like, oh, my organic content is not working. No, you haven't been consistent enough for a long time. It's the same thing as building muscle. You go to the gym and you start training. The, you, the first month, you're going to get stronger, but do you actually see it in the mirror? Or does that take time? It's the same thing with your business. You've got to be consistent and putting in reps, and then you're going to grow. So that's literally how long it takes. I think one of the biggest mistakes is people don't understand the compound effect. Like, for example, this podcast we're doing right now, we'll sit on the internet whilst we're still dead and still people will still listen to it and be educated and entertained, hopefully. And the reality is people don't understand that, like, right now, people still listen to podcasts I made four years ago. Like, there's another great episode of you and me and my fitness podcast, The Shredder Shows. People can listen to that. And the reality is, like, once you put almost, like, these assets out there, they work for you like 24 seven people just listening, absorbing and like warming um, yeah. people up to you. And something that I'm a big fan of in terms of um, is using short form content to get people to long form content. That's literally how social media works. But a lot of people get that wrong. And, and that's what they don't expect. They think to make long form to get to short form. But the reality is like what you want to do is use short form content like real TikTok, whatever to pull eyeballs in and then pull those people to the, the longer stuff like the podcast, yeah. YouTube videos because that's where people are going to know, like, and trust you. Yeah. And you want to get yourself to the point where, like, you almost create celebrity status in your field of what you do. So people just buy because you are who you are. Well, there's this saying that people need to spend an hour of content with you to spend a thousand bucks with you. Like, it's going to be hard to do that with reels. <laughs> like, you got to make a six, lot of reels. Six second cat reels. <laughs> yeah, like, especially super short ones. People have to watch a lot of those things in order to be wanting to spend money with you. While a podcast, a YouTube video, a 10 minute video is probably the easiest way to do it so yeah you grab the attention with the short form you direct them to your long form to get more and that's how you create fans 
And those are the people that are going to buy from you. And what can be done with this now with AI is fucking insane. So we had a, a training call on Mastermind last night and I was playing around with it some of it earlier on in terms of some of the new AI, AI, AI softwares you can use with stuff like Tweet Hunter and using that to write copy for you for podcasts and scripts and chat GBT4. And it, it, it's quite frankly, frank, frank, like frightening. Um, and we'll do some podcasts and YouTube videos. So we'll go through that in more detail. But this is what people don't understand is that, yes, social media is more competitive than ever, but it's actually easier than ever to make world-class content and actually make stuff people want to listen to. Yeah. It's just you need to know who your audience is and you just need to have a sort of message you're totally behind. Like I think a lot of trainers try to be too much vanilla. They don't want to step on the wrong foot. I think you should be polarizing. Because if you always tell the same thing and you actually and you, you actually believe it, it's going to work better. Like if I l just think out of my head, like the most successful coaches that I know, for example, one of the ones that I come up is Kino Body. He's been preaching intermittent fasting and reverse pyramid training for over a decade. That's probably why he's successful, because he just ticked, stick to it. The guy that's pre uh, preaching intermittent fasting, and then it's keto, and then it's paleo, and then it's like carnivore. You're like, what should I eat? Like, it's not pretty clear. The marketing message is always changing. So pick one thing that you actually believe in that you do yourself and just keep hammering that home. And that's when people like, after a couple, uh, because most people, they follow your social media for six to nine months before they actually start reaching out to you. So if they see something and they keep seeing results, I'm like, I'm doing something totally different and I don't get the results. Maybe I should try that approach because that seems to work a lot better. Like you want to get to that point and then it's very easy to sign somebody up because you need to change their belief system in order for them to reach out to you and sign them up. Because if that doesn't happen, you're going to get, I need to think about it. So that's really how you solve that. So I think you need to find a marketing message you're totally behind and just keep hammering that home and showcasing it working and then people will reach out to you. Do you think people who are listening to this who are fitness trainers, online coaches, should compete? No, not necessarily. Because I never competed. My, no, so my business is still doing great. I did coach a lot of people to the stage. I did that. And I will say it helped me in the beginning with amazing before and after photos because if you take somebody out of shape and you put them on stage, you will have a great before and after photo. So it helps with that. But I think probably doing photo shoots will get you more clients than stage photos. But also your productivity, the last couple of weeks before a, a competition, is going to be so low, it will actually hurt your business. Response times will be, on check-ins will be late. You won't be responding to messages because you're so tired. You won't even be as friendly as normal because you might be like hangry and do some stuff. So I think a photo shoot, you can still be functional and doing stuff. So that will probably be better. And if you do a couple good photo shoots, you probably have more with those pictures than you on stage because you cannot use them for a lot of stuff. But photo shoots, photos in the gym, on the beach, stuff like that, they just do better. So I would advise that more. 100%. With your journey of building your fitness business, what would you say is the biggest mistakes you made? Uh, a lot now, number one is probably like, I was a terrible seller in the beginning. Couldn't sell? Couldn't sell. Okay, how did you fix that? A lot of reps. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, probably I didn't close over 900 calls before I first closed my first one. So I literally was like, I'll just keep going. And, and, and it took me probably like 500 calls before I was like, maybe I should record a call and listen to myself back what I'm actually saying and where I'm going wrong. So, so, and then what I started doing, I would start listening to Grant Cardone stuff, Zig Ziglar, Brian Tracy, and actually starting to learn like, okay, how do you actually sell? Because I had no clue. So I started, so those three names, Grant Cardone, Zig Ziglar, Brian Tracy, just get the audio books. Don't start reading the books, it takes way too long. So listen to the audio books, you'll get better at selling. And I listened to something and I was like, I have two recalls today. Let's try that out. See how that goes. And some things you're like, oh, that doesn't work for me because that's not my style. And then you basically create your own framework of what works. So that's probably number one. Then the second one was when I needed to first hire my first team member. I was like, oh, nobody can coach as good as me. That's like... That limiting was, belief. That was my limiting belief. Like, I'm a really good coach, but nobody can do it. I literally got to the point, I think three, four weeks ago, we were running a camp. And... One of my coaches was teaching an exercise and I was like, she literally said the exact same words as I would say when sitting somebody down, correcting the same things I would have said. 
And then I listen to a check-in later for quality control. So we do check-ins and I'll, we'll check them if the coach is actually doing the thing. I listened to the check-in. I was like, I probably wouldn't say a single word differently than what the person said on the check-in. I was like, I literally created copies of myself than doing the work. So you, it takes a lot of time to train them, but it is possible that they get as good as you or sometimes even better. Like I told you that we had a, uh, the client with, uh, we had like PDS and the coach wrote an answer and I was like, half of the stuff I actually don't know because I didn't specialize in it and the coach is specialized in that. So they gave an answer that was like, that's better than I could ever could have said it because I probably needed to Google it and to go to that level because I have no clue. Like I know the basics of it, but not in depth to that knowledge. So you can even find specialists in certain things to actually make your coaching even better. What would you say is the key to building your coaching team? Culture. That's probably number one. So you need to have a great vision where people are like, I want to be part of that team and then it needs to be fun to work for you. Like, I don't believe in micromanaging and all that stuff. Like, I, that stuff doesn't work. I think people should love to work for you and you should make it as fun as possible for them to do it. And then you get a team that actually wants to work and who loves to do the stuff that you ask from them. I think you only have to micromanage people if you have the wrong people. Yeah. Because they're in, like inherently people want to do a good job. So... You, you as the owner of the business, if you teach them correctly and give them clear guidance so this yeah. is what needs to be done, if it's the right person, they'll just do it. Yeah, I think the biggest mistake most times are being made that people are being trained too quick. They don't give enough time to a new member to actually train them properly so they know what to do. So on average, if we hire, hire a new coach, it takes six months to get them to a level that we're like, oh, now we're happy. So we'll train them every day, working day, for six months. We'll give them assignments, we'll give them books, we'll give them check-in, feedback on everything that they're doing. So we'll just make sure they're at the level that we're like, oh, now you're amazing. Because I don't want my clients to get a support service, I want them to get a great service. So that's those things. Same thing with setters, train them for six months, every day meet at least for an hour, show them how it's being done. Like, the best thing that I've seen myself, myself doing is like, booking two, three calls an hour in front of my setters and they're actually seeing me chatting doing it and, like, and so they start believing oh it's actually possible and he's not doing something i cannot do he's literally typing messages that i do like some people are like, oh i hire a setup from an agency that's not gonna work it's the worst advice i've ever heard from people. yeah because an agency doesn't have your language you talk a certain way so especially if people pretend to be you which i personally don't do i have my setters introduce themselves as assistants so they cannot mess up and but still they want to chat in a certain way in a certain language because fitness people have a language like they will talk about bulking and cutting and uh, die breaks and refeeds a normal setter has no clue what those means were uh, me, uh, words mean but if you teach them that stuff and you give them the language and the knowledge they will actually do that pretty good and people are more likely to uh, book in because of their they're talking the language they want to talk about one of the secrets I found with that is actually I get my uh, VAs and setters to listen to my own podcast about fitness. Yeah. So then they actually listen to how I talk. The we actually which put I talk. them in a program. We just get them shredded. Like if they're going through it, they can actually talk about experience as well. So one of the best things that my setters did, this is a small hack that we did. So some of my setters have had amazing transformations. They showcase the wrong transformation. Like this is the result that I got. It works. And like they shared their own before and after photo and all that stuff. And, that like they then they start selling the call and emotion, which is a great way to sell. So that works really good. Something you mentioned there as well is about um, Cesar and VA agencies. So here's a sneaky hack that I know a lot of them do, which people need to be wary of. It's these people will get you to sign up for their setter agency. They'll get their best person put them on the account to start off with. So they do really well at the beginning. When you've made the second payment, they pull that person off, put like a new person in. And then performance will drop down, but you presume it's still good because you got the you thought the original person still on there. And I think that's where people need to understand that you need to not rent other people's employees. You need to have your own employees who work yeah. for you that you train. The best uh, thing I would say, even coaches, get a former client who was a great success story within your coaching. They got the knowledge aspect because they've done your program, but also the practical experience. Same thing with setters. Just get somebody who. Who loves to like to you? You talk to them on check-ins. They're easy to talk to. Like they're just friendly. Grammar is on point. Like you get somebody from your coaching clients to be a setter from you. They probably do a lot of better job than even if you hire a professional setter who's been trained for let's say six months, because they don't know your program inside out. Funny 
uh, thinking about it. So anyone who's on seven figure scaling system mastermind will know him. You know Corel as well. So Corel started a set for me. He used to do messaging, yeah. and then went into doing coaching. So like he's been through all those processes, and that's the same thing in terms of someone who knows the language and knows how to correspond with people because that makes a big difference. And I think I had this conversation with a client today. It's like the big mistake a lot of people make is they try and underpay and just get anyone in the cheapest person yeah. they can. Whereas the reality is like that person holds the gateway to you signing up loads of clients. So yeah. it's I'd overpay to have the right person. Yeah. I actually pay my setups for a pretty decent amount because I'm like, if they do a good job, my sales calls will have an easy job. So it just works easier. Well, it's true because it's the way the call's framed, right? Yeah. Like if the call's framed and positioned correctly, then it's not confrontational for the closers to try and take it. Yeah. Which I think is a big mistake. And anyone listening to this, if you take your own sales calls, you're going to know very quickly if your set is fucking throwing you in the deep end with like just getting anyone on the phone they can. Yeah, that's the most frustrating call there is because if you literally get on the call and they ask like, who are you? And then it's not a good call. That's going to be a very hard sales call. In terms of that, one of the things that warming people up before calls, I don't know what you suggest for this, but a couple of things that we do is obviously you have an email sequence you try and warm people up with to yeah. tell you who you are, social proof, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but we also send them to like podcasts, YouTube videos, again, long form content. Yeah. Um, a lot of it, even like client testimonials to really try and get people warmed up to who we are and that we are real people. Yeah. Is there anything else additionally for people who listen to this that you do that might be different? Most of that is similar. Like we will get them to long form content so they can see it. We'll give them free courses and stuff like that that we made so they can see the value. Like, oh, this is different. This is a higher level than I expected. It's like stuff like that will do. Yeah, I'm saying. One thing um, we're really killing it with at the moment, and I know it's your big background, is Facebook ads. Yeah. Do you think people need to use Facebook ads to scale? And at what point and when would you advise that? Uh, to scale, you need a certain pace strategy. It doesn't need to be Facebook, it can be anything. So, but Facebook is an easy one. Like, probably, I think the ads platform is probably the easiest one to understand compared to like if you take YouTube ads, Google ads, stuff like that. They're way more complicated. So, Facebook is probably one of the easiest ones. It will get more challenging because there's so many people now advertising on Facebook. So, I used to get leads for less than a, less than a dollar. Now, I can dream about that now because it will never happen again. So, it's more challenging. So, I think first you need to have a very good sales process that works. So, I'll probably get you over. 50, 60K a month, at least, before I start running ads. Below that, I don't think you're going to make a profit on it because it's, you need a very strong backend to make it work. I think, uh, and this is interesting, I talk from my own experience in growing another business with Seven Figure Scaling Systems. Uh, you were taking the piss out of me the other day that oh, you're finally trying to grow about, we're starting to run paid traffic for this now. But the reason I hadn't done it to that point is because the sales process wasn't as dialed in as yeah. I want it to be. And I want, it's like, the way I explain paid advertising is like adding fuel to the fire and I needed to make sure the fire was burning correctly and we were like burning all the wood on the fire that was coming in yeah. before trying to put more fuel in, if that makes sense. And I think people often sometimes try and put the cart before the horse and will try and use paid advertising before they, their closing's really fixed. And if yeah. it, like an easy way to think about it is if you're sick at closing, your sales offer is so good that people can't say no all of your ads start to work. And yeah. that makes the ads really easy, right? Yeah. Like it's literally like, okay, you put the ad out, like, but like you can trust this, like you put an IG story out or a Facebook story, how many people reply to that who actually seen it? Then from that point, how many people do you actually book in from a call? How many people do you close? If that number works, then what should you just do? On Facebook, ads, you're just gonna put a zero behind it. But instead of that, you would say, okay, for every zero that I put behind it, it's probably gonna be a thousand bucks. So does the, are you still profitable if you put a zero behind it? And you add a thousand bucks on the front end. If the answer is no, probably not a smart thing to start running ads. Like that's the simple formula if you want to explain it for yourself. Like that's how you can calculate it. And I think this is also important for people to understand one of the big mistakes that I made, but I didn't know any better at the time because I didn't have anyone else to guide me was uh, I started with a low ticket program. So yeah. like a thousand, fifteen hundred people in the Shred and Eight program, which was like an eight week transformation program. We were selling it for like, I don't know, fifty, hundred pounds a month. Um, and I thought well, I was balling. And then I remember a client from the US wanted one to one coaching with me. And I got him and he signed up for 10K for a year. And I was like, holy shit. I was like, I got this one guy to pay for almost like half of this entire program of these other like 1,500 people. I was like, why don't I just do more of this? Yeah. And that's when the penny dropped for me and like the limiting belief left. And a lot of people, I think, get stuck in that trap. 
And the issue is as well, if you're running paid traffic and you're selling something that's 50, 100 pounds, it's vile and impossible to really get that to yeah, like, unless you've got a sick back end. Yeah, so for people to understand how it actually works, like say, let's say it's 100 pounds for, uh, for the program. The acquisition cost is probably going to be close to even 100 bucks. So the first month for that program, you're not going to make money. Let the most likely for a hundred pound offer, you're gonna spend 150 pounds to acquire a customer. So they should have spent at least two months with you to make profit. If you're still in the EU or the UK, you still have taxes, so you're not making money at all. And VAT. So, yeah, and VAT. So it's probably gonna be three months, and then you have software costs, you have staff members maybe even. So the fourth and fifth month are also important, probably even more. So it's probably gonna take you six months to make a profit. So how likely are people to stay six months on that low ticket program before you start actually making some money? Not even a lot, but some money. So that's why it's very a dangerous way to actually grow your business because it's quite easy to sell somebody for like say $250, $300 a month and keep them there for six months if you do the personal one-on-one coaching. Which is, if I say, do you think you can that, get 10 people at that price point? And the software cost doesn't need to be as high because you could literally use Google Sheets in the beginning and get all profit out of it. Like that's how you can easily make already. Let's say let's say it's two fifty a month, it's two and a half k. So that you're already making and you didn't spend anything minus the VAT and the taxes, you're still going to keep some money over it. You're probably going to need a hundred people in your low ticket program to compare to ten people in your high ticket program at two fifty, which is not even a high ticket yet. But you, it's a start. What I just thought of, which has just pissed me off and amused me at the same time, is I remember I was actually running a lot of paid traffic for the low ticket, and it was fucking working. It was profitable up for the front month, yeah. Um, and and that's for all this iOS crap, and you can retarget people yeah. easily. And if I was running high ticket back then, like I was now, it's like it'd be like shooting fish in the barrel, yeah. Um, which is frightening. In terms of other forms of paid advertising, I know. I've dabbled a bit with YouTube last year, but stepped away from that. I know you've been doing pretty well with that. What, yeah. what does that look like in terms of what you're doing with that? So I think on YouTube, the first thing, you need to be good on camera. So don't start running YouTube ads straight from the get-go. Like first get comfortable in front of a camera so that you can shoot videos. And I will tell you, there's a big difference between shooting a value content piece or a marketing content piece. Like I'll never need to make a second take on a value content piece. A marketing thing where I say, need to say certain lines in a certain sequence, I can mess up those. Hey, it's hard because it's scripted, right? <laughs> it's scripted. Like unscripted is so easy, but scripted is terrible. So, and you have to watch out what you say because there's so many ad compliance rules where you have to stay within. So we say something like I couldn't say that, or you do something like I couldn't do that. So it, it's difficult. And one thing that people forget is how many variations you need to make in order to be successful. So for to give an example, we're running one to a VSL page right now on YouTube. I have to make 25 videos a week so we can split test those 25 videos. And next week I need to create 25 new variations in order to keep it working. So I'll probably shoot for a single campaign before it doesn't work again. I'll probably shoot like close to like 125 videos. And then it's like, okay, new angle, new VSL. And I have to start again. So... It's challenging, so I don't think this is possible to run YouTube ads with a small team, but if you get to a bigger team, like you have multiple video editors, you have people that run your ads and stuff like that, then this, that can work. But if you're still solo or have like maybe two or three team members, start with Facebook ads. It's going to be easier. If you get a bigger team, then YouTube ads can work. I, I agree, and that's one of the things we specialize in the mastermind is helping people with particular like messenger ads. Like yeah. That's what we find really kills it with us and that's why I found frustrating when I was thinking about the Shred Nate days because I used to just like send ad traffic to a click and buy page and everyone would sign up I was like I mean that's easy yeah um, and I did some cool like graphics and hooks I used to do like I don't know like the wizard of shreds with like a Harry Potter yeah, thing yeah I like, still remember yeah, those yeah, things they, yeah they were sick like, to be fair I've actually made some ones for like the for mastermind for business coaching like they might not even convert I might just run them because they're cool but like, yeah. like the scale father like the godfather and stuff yeah. like that they're pretty sick mm. um with uh, your business, and I think everyone has like a moment where like, I explain with a business, I think it's like you're building pressure against a dam, you're building pressure, you feel it's fucking working, it's not going anywhere. What was the point for you where you felt like you burst through the dam and you're like, shit, I can see what I can do with this? Uh, so I remember I was in Vegas, it was New Year's Eve, and I was in Vegas with Paula and I was walking the strip and 
uh, and we were, I think we were walking just straight from like the north side to the south side and just seeing all the stuff. And at that moment, I was probably doing like seven, eight K a month at that point. And that day, that's about an hour's revenue now, right? It, yeah. Now, so the funny thing is, I'm walking there and I check, no, I, I check my phone, probably two casino walking through later. I open my phone and I've made seven K in about two hours and I didn't touch my computer. Or anything. I was just literally walking, having fun, and I looked at my phone. I was like, and talked to Paul, and I was like, "I just made seven k. How?" And I was like, "This is crazy." Like, I wrote an email promotion, and I made it. So that was the first time, and the second time was probably the the big webinar that I did, which blew up my business like crazy. Which don't work anywhere, unfortunately. Uh, but like that was the point. I was like, then I was like, like, okay, this is just crazy because. I'm going to need so many people to help me because I have so many clients now. So that was another one. It's yeah. funny because there's, uh, I remember distinctly sitting in, I think it's saying he Chinese restaurant in Dubai in the Mina Al Salam hotel, uh, sitting there having dinner. I think it might be my birthday or something with, uh, Charlotte at the time. And I remember a PayPal notification coming through for three grand. I was like, holy fucking shit. I was like, the system works. Cause I yeah. just, I just hired someone to take phone calls. I was like, I don't have to do this anymore. I was like, it works. Like I don't yeah. have to do all of it. Yeah, and it, that is like a limiting belief that often you think that I've got to do all the sales calls. I've got to do the coaching. People just want to talk to you, and it's like the reality is, people don't give a shit about you. It's like how you can help them and what's yeah. the end result. Um, and I, I know for me that was a huge thing that really opened my eyes into like, fuck, this isn't a job anymore. This is an actual business. Yeah, and it's the crazy. Sometimes you just get the feeling of like, I remember like I just play this game. You probably do the game same thing as well. So I, I take a flight. And whatever <laughs> I played for the flight, I'm gonna try to make back on the plane. So, and especially like sometimes I'll get an economy flight ticket and I'll upgrade the business because I look at the, like, you always have the last minute deals. So you see the deal and you're like, oh, the upgrade is $1,400, for example. It's a seven hour flight. I can easily make that. So then I'll, like, I'll buy the uh, a Wi-Fi service and then let's get to work and try to make it back in that time frame. So. At that point, you start realizing, oh, this is just fun. Like, you can literally make this a game and do that. And it sounds like you're just doing it for money, but you're actually helping a lot of people with it. So I'm like, I know I can find somebody who has a problem that I can solve. And you just make it a game. Like, okay, where can I find that, pe that person today? And you actually help somebody. It's funny you say that because I just distinctly remember sitting on an Emirates flight taking pre-workout working. Like, literally, I was sitting there and the air stewardess looked at me like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? And I literally had like the pre workout scooper out and I was like, put it in. Because yeah. I was like, literally, I need to pay for like this business flight. I was like, I'm going to work this out. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, I think that's the way I've always seen up to certain, like, I don't know. In my opinion, once you make 20, 30K a month, you can pretty much do what you want. And then yeah. for me, it's more about like, I enjoy the process of building stuff and it's that. Uh, constant progression of feeling like you're improving, which is why I like fitness because you have I think, control. I think there's so many things relatable oh. to between fitness and business. I remember reading Total Recall, the uh, Arnold book. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's so good. Like he literally talks about how he used his bodybuilding for his acting career, for his political career, and I was like, that just makes so much sense because I'm literally doing the same thing. It's like I got my KPI dashboard, and I just how can I progressively overload this thing, <laughs> and I just keep doing that. And this is even like. And even people who are, say you're signing up business executives for fitness programs to say the same thing. It's like, if you're really fucking good at business, fitness is the same thing. You just need to be organized, structured, and have goals and have a plan of what you're doing. Yeah. Because like, you don't walk into the office being like, I don't want to do it today. But like, they're the best clients there are. Like, if you have somebody who's really successful at business, they're so easy to coach because they're organized, they're structured, their mindset is on point. Like, you're going to get some crazy before and after photos with somebody like that. It's funny you say that because I, with, with the similarities, because I think that all the time. And that's why I find once you get good at one, the mentality then applies to your other. Even looking at like, I don't know, competition prep, for example, like when you feel like arse at the end where you're really struggling, it reminds me of when you're having really challenging times in business and it like builds that resilience in you of like, you just got to yeah. keep going. Whereas like, I think a lot of people sometimes feel like they want to just hide under the duvet, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, that, there's a reason why I think 90% of the business fail within the first year and then in the next five years, another 90% fail. Something like that's the statistic. It's crazy high. And I think that uh, it's a lot of it has to do with just staying disciplined and just keep doing the actions you need to do every day. I think I, I might bastardize this, but I think there's a statistic that only 5% of businesses ever make a million dollars in sales. Yeah. 
which is quite frightening, really. Yeah, but like, how many people can stay on a diet plan for 90 days? Probably also less than 5%. Mm. Like, it's just, it's not complicated. The formula is easy. That doesn't mean it's easy to do. It's still hard, but you need to be so consistent. It's not complicated. It's not complicated, but it's hard. And, and that, it's boring. And it's boring because it's doing the same thing over and over and over again. And when you're talking about making content earlier, it made me think of like how many times have I talked about a calorie deficit yeah. on front of the camera. It's probably 1,000, 2,000 plus. Yeah. Because that's the basis of everything, really. Like, I think there are five core messages that a fitness business has. And you're like, piece one, piece two, piece three, piece four, piece five, go back to piece one. Just change the title a little bit. Like... That's literally what I did for a long time and just worked. And I just kept doing that. Uh, and an easier hack for anyone with that now, we do this a lot with captions, is literally get our best performing captions, put them in chat GBT and be like, please rewrite this for me. And yeah. guess what? It gives you the same thing, but in a different format. Yeah. And then you can shoot that again. And um, it just works. Uh, talking of AI, what are the AI tools you're utilizing mainly at the moment? Uh, so we use chat GPT for that. Goes in. We've used Jasper to... For, for example, YouTube videos, write a description, stuff like that. Uh, we use that for email copywriting ideas. We we look at it, at, but we don't even copy it. So because we noticed as soon as we start copying it, it's not going to work that great. So we just use it for our, our ideas. Uh, we got the one for uh, cutting up videos. Uh, Video.ai? AI? Now that one and another one. That's Autopod. Okay. That, that one is really good. Uh, which one? I personally don't even use that many. My team does. So uh, so those are the ones. Uh, Adobe, the podcast one, yeah. that cuts up the audio and makes the background sound perfect. We use that a lot. Uh, the video we use, uh, I think those are the most ones we use. With something you mentioned earlier, was uh, webinars not working anymore? Do the, you the old format doesn't work. Do There's a certain way that works. The old format doesn't work. Do you work. think there's such a thing as fully evergreen uh, strategies that are going to work? No. Like, I've tried so many times, but, like, who can? I don't think there's a single offer that just keeps working. There needs to be something changing. So I think an offer can work for 10, 12 weeks perfectly. But, like, then the season of the year is changing, and people are going to want some different things. So there's not a single thing that just keeps working all the time. Or you need to be in a very specific niche. Like, that might work. Like, take what, uh, like take something with diabetes, for example. If you have diabetes, a certain angle can work. That I can see how that works. But if you have, like, a fat loss related thing, you're going to talk different to somebody who, when it's January compared to when it's July. Like, there's a big difference in that. So I think there needs to be a switch in that because I've had some amazing results with webinars in the beginning. Then I made them evergreen. They're always going to dip less than what the live webinar does, but they won't stay on that forever. Like, they're just going to go down eventually because a lot of people have seen them. With you managing the business, how many businesses do you have? Right now, six. With six businesses, you now have Joy, Baby Joy, Paula, and Training. How do you structure your week to factor in everything and be successful? So I did a lot of coaching with Craig Ballantyne, who taught me structure. So it's like blocks for everything. So it's literally it's like a Monday morning, I do this. Then I, then Monday like late morning, I do this. Monday early midday, I do that. So there's like set blocks in there that I spend time with Paul and Joy, which sounds weird that you actually need to block in time for your wife and your kid, but like... In other ways, you will just find something else to do. So I just block out 90 minutes every day so that it, it's at least in there. It could be more, but there's at least 90 minutes in there. So same thing with training. I just put blocks in there when I train. So And I made my life very efficient. Like I got a sick home gym, so I don't have travel time at all. It's always close by. So I am eliminated like everything that basically took time. I eliminated that. Like I got people working in the back of my house, so I don't need to go to an office because waste of time i i'm gonna be in traffic so i eliminated a lot of that stuff already and like a lot of it now is virtual so zoom meetings starting up is like super quick so it's just like i think just structure and prioritizing things so it's like okay you make a list what are your top 10 priorities number one is going to go first on the calendar number two is going to go second and just go like that and what does your process to identify what your priorities are look like i think that those change every quarter because i don't believe there's balance 
Do you believe uh, in having a business plan for the year and that actually you can stick to it? Because one of the, like I, I think I, you can I, have a goal for the yeah, year, yeah, but, I think but it like a whole time. Yeah. a whole plan. Like I remember just before COVID, it was the first time that I wrote a sick plan. I was like, I'm gonna do this the next twelve months, and I'm just gonna go. COVID hits, plan can go in the toilet. Like doesn't work. So what we do now is a quarterly plan. So we plan out a quarter. We'll have three main targets for marketing, for sales, and fulfillment. And we'll just focus on those three things. And then at the end of the quarter, we'll evaluate, make new ones. And that seems to work really good. And then within a quarter, we have six-week sprints. So we're going to try to finish one thing in six weeks. And then another thing in another six weeks. So that's how we do it. What software system do you use to manage all that? It's Google Sheets. All, everything's Google. Do you use... Uh, what do you use for like task management and things like that? Yeah, so Asana? we have Asana and we have some things in Trello. Okay. Yeah. The Because um, I think that's one of the areas a lot of people get stuck is that as their business gets scale, it can get quite messy in terms of communication and who's doing what and managing clear yeah, guidelines. I think an organogram roles and responsibilities, just that needs to be so clear written out. That I think that's the owner's job. Probably to, that's probably no, your number one job is to just give everything like structure, organization, like to just people know like, oh, if I have this problem, I go to this person. If I have that problem, I go to that person. If I need to find this, I just look here and I can find it. Like it sounds so simple, but like I remember we made one uh, Google sheet and it's literally it's just a simple Google sheet. It has like a title for a thing and a, and a link where you can find it. And we just made tabs for every program. So, for example, for my shredding program, for my Bigger for Life, for my Shredder for Life, for my Dominant, for, like everything is in the bottom, like tabs. You just click it and, oh, here's the list of this. This is the list for this event. Or I need to find this SOP. You just click it and you go there. It's a simple Google Sheet. Everybody can make it, but it saves about 10 hours a week from just finding stuff. And so everybody loves that Google Sheet. Nobody would ever change anything in it because it's so easy. And it's probably the whole business runs on a simple Google Sheet with like nine tabs, and that's it. Now, obviously, you're happily married. You've got a uh, beautiful child. For guys and girls out there who want to go fucking on a mission to scale their business, do you think people are better off being in relationships or being single? It depends. That's the honest answer. I think if you have a partner that actually uh, helps you as a grow as a person, it can benefit. But if you have a spouse who works against you, you're better off alone. So that, and you need to have a partner who's very understanding. Like, there are so many days that I work insane hours that Paul is like, I'll just do my own thing and spend time on my own because I'm like, she, she cannot even keep up most days. So she will like, I'll spend time with you that time frame when I'm like, have my energy. But the other times, I'm just going to do something else where I can just relax. Otherwise, she won't like, keep up because I'll, if I'm like working towards a goal, I'll push a pace that not many people can manage. So she's not going to go with that pace. She's just going to jump in for like an hour and then jump out and do something else. And I think that's a skill that your spouse needs to have to is like to see like, oh, I can do this. I can do that. And I think communication is super important. So you need to have similar, uh, like you need to have a structure like, oh, we're going to go to this. Like if it's uh, a with your family, you need to have like a mission. We're going to do this. We're going to go to this. These are our values. This was important to us. And still put time in. Like there's still a date night. Do you actually have those written down, like values and stuff like that? Uh, uh, some of them, not all of them. But we'll, I mean, if we ask them, we can name them pretty easily. So, but we'll still have a date night every week. And like, we'll still uh, do stuff. Like even now with Joy, we still have a date night that we do. We still travel somewhere together just by ourselves. No kids with us, just so that we can spend time together. We'll still make time for those things, so then it can work, I think. But there needs to be a balance. Like she can understand that sometimes I fly out for like two weeks and I just work like crazy hours, but she doesn't realize how many hours I actually put in in those two weeks while she's just resting because she was like, "Frank's not here. I'm gonna sleep eleven hours a day." I was like, "I could never sleep eleven hours a day. Like that, that my body doesn't work like that." So I think there's a difference in that. Now. The two biggest things that have an impact in terms of your success in life is one, obviously, who you have as a partner. Second is obviously going to be the environment you're in. How important do you think the environment surrounding you is? It is very important, I think, but you have so much influence on it. Because I think environment is important, but it's actually 
because if I look at it when I started, like the Netherlands is not the most ambitious spot in the world by far not. Like UK is probably a little bit worse, but it's not like it's not that the Netherlands is so much better. That's like America, where some people are. Do you think the UK is worse than the Netherlands? London maybe not, but like the rest of it, like Northern England, Northern right. England by far, yeah. Like, the, like you will get depressed if you just go there. So, like I've been to those places, like you don't want to live there. Uh, but I think what helps is like I remember when I just started my online business, like I didn't have anybody running an online business. But what I basically did is I got so much input from like YouTube. Like I started following people that. They were basically my friends, even though they didn't know I existed. But I listened to so much to those people. So my influence just changed by like their voice and by their actions. Because they were doing stuff and I started acting like it, even though I didn't know them actually in a real person. So I think you can make that work for a while. At some point, you need to switch and actually get to a real environment. But in the beginning, it can definitely help. Because I know a lot of people listening don't have the budget to maybe go to like the places where you can find the people that are motivating. So starting off, I think that's a really good one to start with, like listening to certain audio books, which are cheap to do, listening to, like following people on social media that you inspire you. Like, I think that definitely can get you to a certain point. Then you need to get into groups because I remember going to the US with a fitness mastermind and there was this, they started off with, and one of the things they started with is like, what's your name? Who do you help? How much do you make? Those were the three questions. So the Europeans don't like talking about how much they make either. No, in, no, in Americans, they love that stuff. So they go like a snake through the room, to the back. And I'm sitting there and I was talking to a guy next to me. And I was like, okay, you're not a great trainer. <laughs> like, like, I would listen to him and he was explaining how his program works. I'm like, how can you serve your clients like that? That stuff doesn't work. So the round goes around and he, he stands up, tells who he is, how, where he's from, and how much he makes. I was like, hey, how much do you make? That's a lot more than I do. Like, how? So... At that point, I basically got frustrated because I was like, I need to go next. First of all, I'm, I'm going to look like nothing compared to that guy. And I think I'm a better trainer in my mind. So at that point, I got so motivated. like, he's got to be doing something better than me. So I started like looking at it like, okay, what's he doing? What am I doing? And I started, okay, I need to do more because apparently you can do so much more even at a lower level. So I'm doing something wrong. So... You change your mindset a lot because you get that. And I've seen multiple people get mindset shifts like that just from stuff like... Another example is the one that I told you about with Paul and Dorian Yates. So in order to improve my knowledge, I did uh, a lot of personal training sessions with Dorian Yates when I was in Marbella. So I did a workout, leg workout with Dorian Yates and he basically killed me that day. So I look at my phone after the workout and five minutes later, there's a sales call lined up for me to do. And I'm like... I cannot even stand. <laughs> like, I'm dizzy as hell. So I give my phone to my wife. I was like, can you do the sales call for me? Because in five minutes, I could never reach somebody else. I was like, this is the price point. You don't have to sell because she has her own fitness business. But my price point was way higher than hers. So I gave her the phone. I was like, just sell me. Like, that's easy. You know what I can do? Just sell me. And she does the call, says the price point, and the client says, perfect. Yeah, I'll do this. And she was like, okay, you can sell that price point. Instantly, she could raise her prices. But just doing that. So you see, like, environment makes a big shift if you see the stuff around you. I know Chris talks about the story all the time when he was with Ben, and Ben closed the client, like, in 15 seconds with a price point that's way higher than FC. That changed his mind about a lot about stuff about high ticket. So I think that stuff definitely w helps a lot. Do you think I've changed since being in Dubai in a different environment? I think, yeah, a lot. Like, we, we rem I remember talking to you about, like, how your sales were doing when you were in the UK and you come to Dubai and you basically blow up, you go back to the UK, you drop that back down and then you go back up when you go to Dubai. And I'm like, just stay there. <laughs> like, that's probably... So I think environment definitely makes a big difference. But also, if you just look at it, like, if you're in, the, in certain places, they're not attractive to look at. So your social media is not going to be as great as well as you're in Dubai. Any angle you take it, it's going to look pretty. So it definitely makes a difference in that. I think... It's not like you're going to make thousands more just being in Dubai. Like You still have to put in work. But reach is going to be better. So I think that will make a difference. 100%. And I think also you can just film anything and it looks good. Like you just go out for dinner, it looks sick. you got the birds yeah. or whatever. But like I think just having an inspiring life is way more attractive to follow than somebody who's in their living room all the time and there's nothing special to see. And, and this is a throwback. I used to like, we used to do calls and I'd be in my little shed in my garden in the UK. Yeah. And 
Uh, I actually sometimes look back to the shed days as like it was it was the good days in terms of like it was quiet, it was peaceful, and like the, the internet was shit. But yeah, and, and also talking about that, like there was like no fucking heating in there, and in the summer it was about a billion degrees. So like now I sit in my like office overlooking Dubai Marina, and I'm like this is pretty cool. And uh, it's funny you talk about motivation. So I've, I've flipped my office around now, so my desk faces outwards. And so I've got like the marina like I'm facing it all day and I like, yeah. just see boats and shit go past. I'm like, fuck, I need to work harder. Yeah, because it, it definitely helps. Like I remember like sometimes like the Netherlands, like especially where I live, I live in a small city in the Netherlands. Like I got a big house, the house is crazy, all that stuff. But as soon as you go out, it's just a small town. There's nothing special there. Like most of the stuff in the Netherlands is like windmills and like uh, farms and stuff like that. It's not that special. So it's not really motivating in that stuff. So I notice if I spend too long in the Netherlands, you get demotivated. And then I travel to some place and you get to see some different things. It helps. So I think the best thing people can do is like travel, especially solo. And you could put it in an environment where you don't know anybody. You basically just got to be you and just have your own habits, create an own structure that week. Like that's the best thing you can do. And just go to a place which you actually like motivate yourself. Like I remember being to places and I'm like, this is pretty cool. And just get motivated by it like I want to do more of this stuff because I like this and you actually start working harder it's like the first time you fight business class you're like fuck I'm not doing economy again because it's like you suddenly there's actually a weird thing about that that when you go business class versus economy it's like it's the only time in life there's a clear define between almost like the successful and the normal people because it's yeah. like left and right right and I think that almost motivates me to be like fuck if you work harder then life gets easier and I think people don't understand that you can sacrifice a lot now to then have a much easier rest yeah. of your life. Whereas most people take the easy option now and then they have a harder rest of their life, if that yeah. makes sense. I, I remember one time, like the first event I went to in the US was in Miami. And it was in the Intercontinental, uh, Intercontinental Hotel, which was right next to the American Airlines Arena where the Miami Heat play, which is an expensive hotel. It was like 500 bucks a night. But at that point, like I was, I was already happy that I could pay the event. Let's say go to a hotel that's five hundred bucks a night for a week. No way possible. So I got a cheap Airbnb shared room nearby, and that was already nicer than what I expected it to be. So I remember walking just there and walking to Miami the first time. I was like, this is pretty sick. <laughs> and then going to that hotel, which is like a five star luxury hotel, all the stuff it was. And we went out to dinner, and the dinner was paid for. And I was like it's good that it's paid for because I cannot afford a single thing here on the menu today like because it was that expensive and I was like I like this surrounding but I need to work hard to get myself to this level and you probably look back at that now and think fuck that's I was like we, like, we talked about the comfort zone and stepping out of your comfort yeah. zone you'll, you'll touch the stress level there because you're like different city didn't know how to get around yet all that stuff like you have to learn so many new skills in a single week which you didn't have before like that will push you but it's in a week you can grow so much by doing that and i think that's one of the things that's helped me a lot is pushing myself to travel and do meet new people go to stuff like that and anyone listening to this we have a an event um 7th 8th of july where frank will be speaking as well in las vegas which will be a two-day business mastermind event so if anyone wants to come to that, hit link below this podcast and sign up or drop me a message on Instagram. And going back on to topic in terms of growth, people listening to this, what would you say is the two two to three biggest things they should focus on for the rest of 2023 to focus on growing the business? I think always keep learning. So don't be afraid. But if you look at learning, so a lot of people try to learn everything. Just look at where the biggest growth can happen. For a lot of coaches, it's not being a better coach in training or nutrition. It's like marketing and sales. Just put a quarter in and like, okay, optimizing your marketing and just study an hour a day just on marketing. Not Monday to Friday, every day. An hour a day. And then another hour, start applying what you've just learned. Just don't just learn, but also apply the stuff. And then the third thing I would do is just like get the same results for your clients. Like, you can do anything in the world, but if people don't get results, first of all, they're not going to continue with you because you can be a nice guy, but if you don't get the result, they're going to leave. But also, if you just like, my mission for my company is literally like, we're going to give you a transformation so good that when you walk into a birthday party, people are like, what the hell did you do? And they're selling you the whole evening. Like, then we did a good job. So if you can do that, your business will keep growing because it's that easy. Because, like, that person will say anything you want <laughs> because they got an amazing experience. So if you're able to create that, you just keep growing. 
when it comes to learning, what would you say your f- the best books you'd recommend in maybe like YouTube channels or something like that? Uh, so I think oh, let, there are different levels to learning. So I think first you need to learn. So for that, I would probably recommend Limitless by Jim Quick. That's a really good book. Uh, like on how to learn. Then probably I would say use Atomic Habits from James Clear next. I'm actually rereading that at the moment. It's yeah. my favorite book. Because first you need to learn how to learn. Then you need to learn the habits to actually implement that stuff. And then we can go into like whatever subject you need. So that's going diff- to be different for everybody. But I think those two skills are probably going to help you in the, in the beginning. And then it's like, yeah, where do, you, where do you need the most help with? So is that sales? Is that marketing? Like for sales, I'll probably recommend Tannix Rule by Grant Cardone or Sell or Be Sold. Those are two great. Marketing is probably my next, like Marketing by uh, Dan Kennedy. It's a really good book. So, or Sell Like Crazy by Sabi Sabu. Like those are really good books to start off with. And then it's like, yeah, where do you need more help with? Is that personal development where you want to grow? Is it like you need even more training and habits? Or yeah, where do you want to go? Because there's so many options. I think one of the areas people often get stuck is they're afraid to ask for help sometimes as well. Whereas I think that's something I've always been like. I don't think that's actually the problem. What do you think it is then? People don't know where they're stuck, and they don't yeah. know which question to ask. Which it, because I get someone like, "Can you recommend me a good book?" I get that question probably much but for five what? times a day uh, in my DM. And I'm like, "That's the wrong question to ask," because it depends on the, what you need help with. <laughs> so a lot of people, I think, just first need to determine why they're stuck. And then, okay, and basically ask a question like, I'm stuck here. What would the first step be what you would do? That's a better question. So explain where you're stuck and what would be the, fir- what would be the first step that you would do? That's already a better question because you're probably going to get a better answer than what you're hoping for. So I think a lot of people should learn how to ask best their questions. It's the same thing with chat GPT. It can be amazing if you ask the right prompt. <laughs> but if you ask the simple question, it's going to be Google. So it's the same thing like that. Uh, and that's why one of my favorite sayings, and I say it to people all the time, is like, a genius doesn't have great answers, he asks great questions, because yeah. if you ask someone the right question, it's easy for them to then help you. Yeah. The same as if you're a fitness coach and the client asks you the right question of what they're really struggling yeah. with, then it's easy for you to help them get better results. It's as simple as that. Thank you for your time today, Frank. Anytime. What's the best place for people to find out more about you? Uh, well, yeah, first of all, I have to learn Dutch because all my stuff is in Dutch that I do. Some People time, can use Google Translate and you can translate Yeah, it. so probably Instagram is the easiest one. If you just do my le- name in lower cases, just Frank Dem Blanken. Charlie will put it somewhere. Uh, then you can find pretty much anything on Instagram that's pretty easy to find. And there's a translation option at the end of every copy. See Translation RG. For everyone listening to this, if you're looking to blow up your fitness business and you want to book a free diagnostic call to find out how we can help you, you can hit the link below this video and you can book a free call to see exactly where you are with the business and how we can help you. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast, hit the like, give Frank a follow and we'll see you next episode very soon.